in heaven a great and wondrous sign appeared. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. And she was crying out in labor as one about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And its influence or tail drew a third of the stars of the heaven and flung them to the earth. In our last broadcast, we looked at the signs in the heavens above, relating it back to what Jesus said and that was recorded three times in the New Testament. In Matthew, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. In all three cases, Jesus said there would be signs in the heavens above and indicated that the signs would would foretell or portend that the powers of the heavens had been shaken. And from Hebrews we know shaking means the removing of things that can be, removing of created things that are in the heavens that are destined to be removed. Out of all of this we saw that the demonic forces that occupy the second heavens will be swept into the earth. And the dirge of the writer of the book of Revelation, the writer John in chapter 12, is a chilling dirge. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth because the devil has gone down to you and he's filled with fury for he knows his time is short. In the sign that appears in heaven, the constellation Draco, the dragon, represents, of course, the evil one, and his tail or influence that drew a third of the stars of the heavens, attracted them, and they were flung to the earth, is the indication in the stars of the heavens of the coming out of the abyss of the demonic hordes into the earth. This, of course, is something that is rarely ever spoken of, and you you can understand why. What self-respecting preacher wants to risk his reputation for sane and rational preaching to suggest to you that the demonic hordes that now occupy the second rank of the heavens will come into the earth and fall into the earth, as it were, like falling stars. But the fact is, the culture is prepared for this. From the scientific community to the social community, people are wanting to know whether we are the only life in the planet, in the, in the universe. You regularly see from reports that come back where various... Uh, spacecrafts that are sent into deep space to photograph the surface of some of the planets. You you watch scientists pore over the pictures and come up with suggestions that perhaps there was life or indications of what might sustain life on these planets. The fact is that most people when they look up into the night sky and see the myriad stars there, ponder the question of whether or not we're alone in the universe. And if you subscribe to a view different from what the Bible says, then it seems probable that we're not the only life in the universe. And the educated mind prefers to believe that there has to be other life in the universe. Our movies and popular culture have pretty well convinced the population that there are aliens out there. Movies such as Independence Day, a huge blockbuster, and various others, uh, 
since the 50s. These movies have had, many movies have had a common theme of aliens coming. Uh, in fact, a recent uh, uh, mega hit by the star Tom Cruise uh, was just such a such a, a, a premise as that. The remake of the famous uh, film War of the Worlds. It's almost a given now in the consciousness of people that they are aliens, and we somewhat tongue in cheek talk about. Uh, Roswell and Area 51 and so on, with varying degrees of skepticism. It's common to have uh, movies or television programs indicating that there are other life forms. The culture as a whole wants to believe that there are other life forms in the universe. When these demonic spirits come out of the heavenlies, they will not come as spirits. They will come as physical beings who now, because they have been forced out of the heavens and God has ordained that they be on the earth, they will have bodies not human bodies, but a sort of conglomeration of parts. Look, here's the description that Revelation uh, uh, 12, uh, Revelation 9, I'm sorry, speaks of. It says, they have, they're like locusts, so they come out swarming like locusts, and they have tails like scorpions, and they're allowed to sting people, except those who have the mark of the Lord in their foreheads. Then he says, the locusts look like horses prepared for battle. Those are rather large locusts, you would have to admit. And on their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold. We remarked that in their former estates, many of these spirits, many of these angels, or former angels, occupied positions of great authority, respect, and weight as they serve before God. Now they seem to have the vestiges of their former state. On their heads they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. You've heard the old saw that this is probably figuratively speaking of helicopters. That's rubbish. It's speaking about, this is an actual description of what the creatures look like once they're forced to take on a physical appearance in as much as God has ordained that they are now creatures of time and space. They do not occupy their former estates. They have been reduced in this way. And in this condition of being encased in a type of flesh, in a type of um, physical form, they know this, that their time is short. Because as spirit beings, they are not subject to time. But as creatures, now in time and space, clothed in a kind of flesh, they are subject to time and space. And one of the things about time is that time ends. And that's why the enemy is furious, because he knows his time is short. Now for him, the time being short doesn't mean he surrenders. It means he's limited in, what he, in the time he has available, he's limited by time, and he's pressured to formulate new options for his survival. He, in previous times, was nearly successful in obliterating the human race. At the time, for example, of the flood, he came within one family, 
of destroying the human race. His work is predicated upon this truth, that God cannot fellowship with evil. He knows that God started this creation with the intent that when it was done, God would have sons who would arise out of this creation. His view is very simple. If you could turn all of the creation against God, then God would be obligated to destroy them and start over, or destroy as many of them as he would, and then start over. He came very close to achieving this end with the flood. But for Noah and his household, a total of eight souls, he would have achieved it. God, in fact, started over at that point. He came close again when Israel came up to the mountain and refused to come into the presence of God and be transformed. God said that he would wipe them all out and start over with Moses. But Moses asked God for mercy. God granted him mercy and, and the process continued. He came within probably two tribes of destroying the holy seed. You remember, Israel was taken into Babylonian captivity. Actually, what was taken into Babylonian captivity of Israel were only two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And if he had succeeded in perverting Judah, then what would have been the result? The result would have been very simple. The Messiah would not have come. No salvation for the human race because the tribe would have been perverted. But he didn't succeed. What is, in fact, his plan? What does he plan to do? This is not the question of how he plans to, to, to achieve this, but what is it that he plans to do? He plans to wage war against the saints and to, in his goal, utterly destroy them. Because if he can, then God would have to start over. So when he finds himself short on time, his intent is to be filled with, his intent is, is fueled by his fury and his intent is to try and destroy the whole human race. Or more specifically, to try to destroy what God loves. So he will wage war against the, sta the saints. The question will become, and we'll, we'll address this question, how exactly does he intend to wage war against the saints? And what does he hope to achieve by this method? But that's for a later broadcast. But for now, what we're noticing here is that he comes out of the abyss and when they come down out of the abyss, they come as creatures of time and space. Bizarre creatures from the human view of their appearance. Bizarre creatures, nevertheless creatures. They're no longer allowed the, the, the anonymity that characterizes their present state. They're not invisible as spirits anymore. They're not able to come and go between the realms anymore. They're limited by a physical form, and that's how they look. They come to torment humans. The evil one comes with them out of the abyss. Here is a very specific reference to this concept in two chapters over in Revelation the 11th chapter, we're reading in chapter 9, in Revelation 11, this is what is said. First, there is a description of the people of God, and then they're described in a, in a pattern that is common to the Old Testament. They're described as the two witnesses. You'll find the references to the two witnesses as early in the scriptures as the book of Zechariah, where they're referred to as the two sons of oil. They're the anointed one, this ties in perfectly with the anointings of king and priest, the royal priesthood, the order of Melchizedek, which all of the sons of God, all of the children of God are. So in a sense, when he refers to the two witnesses, he's referred, referring to the twin anointings of kings of righteousness and princes of peace. 
Now, concerning these two witnesses, he says, verse 7 of Revelation 11, Now, when they had finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss, we had just been reading in Revelation 9, about how this abyss is open and the stream of the demonic flows out of the abyss, right? Which the, the beast which comes up from the abyss will attack them, them, the witnesses. And the witnesses here are typical of the twin anointings of king and priest. That's why they're referred to in the same language that Zechariah refers to them as the two sons of oil, representing the twin anointings. Sons of oil, oil is the type in scripture that represents anointing. And the twin anointings, if you go back to Zechariah, the twin anointings are very clear, typified by the lampstand and the olive trees. On the earth, in the days of Zechariah, a crown was made of silver and gold. There were two men in the earth who represented the Lord in those days. One was the prince or the ruler named Zerubbabel, and the other was the priest named Joshua or Jesus. The crown was given, the crown normally would be given to the prince, to Zerubbabel in that case. But in this case, the crown was given to Joshua, the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus, meaning that the royal priesthood was conferred upon Jesus. And this was done in the midst of the restoration of the Levitical order, inasmuch as they had just returned from Babylonian captivity and were setting up the kingdom again. This anointing was given to Jesus, the royal priest, because a priest ordinarily doesn't wear a crown, a king ordinarily wears the crown. The crown, however, was put on the head of the priest, not on the head in those days of the king named Zerubbabel. He establishes in the midst of the Levitical order, he establishes the anointing of the twin anointings, the, the royal, meaning kingly, priesthood. And that's the order of Melchizedek. So it's a reference here. This, this reference of the two sons of oil is a reference not just to two human witnesses, but the twin anointing that is able, like Elijah, to shut up the heavens so that it doesn't rain. Now, the beast who comes up out of the abyss wages war against the twin anointings. Here it is in plain language. Now, when they had finished their testimony, verse 7, Revelation 11, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and will overpower and kill them. Now, if, you, if you're left in any doubt as to this being allegorical, the bodies, it goes on to say, verse 8, the bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt. So it tells us it's figurative. Ordinarily, you interpret the scriptures, especially prophetic scriptures, literally, unless they tell you it's figurative. In this case, the two witnesses are specifically spoken to be figurative. And that's easy enough to see because there is no city that is known as Sodom and Egypt. Sodom was, quite a, was in northern Israel, in the northern borders of Israel, and Egypt was way down south. They're not the same location geographically. Therefore, this had to have been figurative, and it tells us that it is. And when it's figurative, of course, then it has to be interpreted. And it goes on to say, where also, in Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Well, Jesus was not crucified in either Sodom or Egypt. He was crucified in Israel. Okay. So again, the figurative nature of the passage is established for us. What do we know then about the, the implications here? We know that the twin anointings is a reference to all of the children of God who walk in this office of king and priest. We know that the beast that comes out of the abyss 
is Satan himself, together with all of his minions. But we also know from the earlier reading, and we know from the subsequent reading, from chapter 9 and chapter 11, or chapter 12, when the, when the star appeared in the heavens, the star called Draco, or the constellation called Draco, it said, this is the star, or this is the constellation, that had seven heads and ten horns. Now that's an absolute key, because we find often and frequent references to seven heads and ten horns. The first of these references is found in Daniel 7. Daniel 7 describes for us a brilliant vision of Daniel. That is a brilliant vision that Daniel had in the night. And let's go to it, because it begins to allow us to see the how. How does Satan, coming forth upon the earth, kicked out of the heavens, how does he intend to wage war against the saints? We know why. He wants to destroy them because his, that's his opportunity to extend his time. He knows that his time is short. In order for him to extend his time, he has to destroy that which God is interested in which God is interested. By destroying them, God has to start over. Satan has more time. See, he doesn't think he will lose the war. He thinks he's had some, had some setbacks, but he certainly doesn't think he will lose. He just needs more time to formulate a better strategy. But now, we see that he begins to wage war against the saints with the intent of destroying them so that he may extend his time. The question for us is how? What is his strategy? And the key, the clue that we've been given is in, as we said earlier, in Revelation 12, in the reference to the falling of the demonic out of the heavens, this specific reference that says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns on his heads. This is the how he intends to engage the saints. Because Daniel will let us into a secret. The secret is that this beast is in fact a kingdom. A kingdom that will rule the whole earth. The secret is simply this. He intends, when he comes to the earth, he intends to establish a kingdom together with kings to entrap the whole earth. You may not have been noticing, but every system on which human life depends on the planet today has been, has been becoming global. Many of the preachers who have talked to us about the, the beast of Revelation 7 and of Daniel 7 and Revelation 12 and 13, they have said to us that the seven heads represent seven geographies that will be ruled over by ten kings. The fact of the matter is it's not about geographies, it's about systems. And I will lay that out for you in subsequent teachings in Scripture. These are about systems. Systems that will control human life. One of the things that's said about the beast is that you cannot, quote, buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. And the other thing that is said about the beast, this kingdom that will arise from the earth, is you can't wage war against it successfully. The problem is the increasingly evangelical Christians are thinking they will not have to face these things. That the, the rapture will come and they'll be taken out. And so these things will come on the earth, yes, but or they'll come in some form, but it's no concern of ours. I want to tell you unequivocally 
we are going to be here. So it's important that we know about these things. The scriptures are abundantly clear and unmistakably plain that the saints are going to be here and we will have to understand the provisions of God for us. You know, life would be incredibly easy if Jesus had not said and the Gospels had not recorded his teaching that there will be the powers of the heavens will be shaken and there will be signs of it in the sun, moon and stars and that we would be handed up or delivered up to all the nations to be persecuted for his name's sake. He put it this way, he said, and you will be hated by all the nations because of me. What what the Lord is revealing to us in this hour, in this hour when on the earth there are earthquakes, at the same time that there are pestilences, at the same time that there is famine, at the same time that the roaring of the seas is taking place, at the same time that the spirit of Antichrist is arising, birth pangs on a pregnant woman, what is happening on the earth is that things are in serious turmoil. But we're going to have to understand what these turmoils are indicating and learn the things that God will give us to survive during this time. It doesn't get better. These are but the beginnings of sorrows, but troubles are ahead for us that are worse than the world has ever seen. That's not good news in the strict sense of the term, but it's where we're heading, and you better find out about it. So continue to study with me. I'm Sam Solon, and we'll talk about this some more. Bye-bye. your thoughts and your cares come walk with us and meet Jesus here broken body broken bread blood turn wine life for I am Sam Solon. I'm the host of the preceding program. We bring you these messages to encourage you in your walk with God. If you'd like a copy of this message, you may obtain it in one of two ways. You may obtain it by writing to me at the address on the screen indicating what program that you desire, or the alternative is to visit our website at www.solon.com. You may download it for free. Either way, it's without cost to you, so feel free to write. If you'd like to know what's going on in the ministry, sign up on the website for our newsletter. Thank you, and God bless you. Bye-bye.